So we have begun already a series of lessons out of Hebrews 11 about what faith is, a definition, um, perhaps a redefinition of what this is based on the fact that, uh, you know, in years past, I think that my approach to this has been uh, not as good or not as complete as it can be today, and that's you know, by the grace of God, we're given time to live longer and see things that we didn't see before and, and uh, try to revisit these, and I hope that that will be an encouragement to you as well. We, uh, I think, most importantly, notice that the, the verses, Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2, by themselves are not... Uh, all there is to the definition of faith, and they shouldn't be lifted from their context. It really started back around chapter 10, verse 35, where he refers back to the prophecy of Habakkuk in chapters 1 and 2, who is asking the question, Lord, why are we suffering so? Why do you look on while injustice happens to your people? A valid question, and a question that is uh, still on the minds of people today, and the answer to that was, Wait for it. It's coming. The just one will live by his faith. You have to trust God that it is coming. And that keep on keeping on is the real meaning of the entire letter of Hebrews. Not just the 11th chapter, but the entire letter. Um, especially the 11th chapter, though. So that's the larger context and the real definition of, for faith. Um, and so we've kind of been taking this apart at a low level in the first uh, in the first and second verses here about faith being the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen is what we're talking about this day. <laughs> I avoided the pitfall. Thank you, David. <laughs> it is post meridian, but is it still morning? It's still noon. I don't know. I think if you went to McDonald's, they would not serve the breakfast menu. I think it's not morning anymore. I'm not sure. But Hebrews 11, we're talking about the conviction of things not seen at this point. The other lessons are available, as mentioned before. But it is at least these three things, the assurance of what we hope for, the conviction of what is not seen, and the means by which we obtain a testimony. Today we're looking at the conviction, the conviction of things not seen. And again, we have to be truthful about the larger, the larger context, which is going back to the prophet Habakkuk. That's what's being quoted, and uh, that's what's, you know, what he's referring back to when he introduces this idea about sticking to it and sticking with it. And so you can be getting over to Habakkuk 2 if you want to. But our term in Hebrews 11 for conviction is typically a word that we use for rebuking or exposing in the New Testament, although not always. And um, a lot of them, I think, are more like what we're reading here in Hebrews 11. But the bottom line there is what I mean. What they have in common is these things that I'm lifting from the from the lexicon. It's an argument of disproof or of refutation. It's a cross examination, uh, testing what somebody says, putting it to scrutiny, especially with the idea that you're going to try to refute it. But this word for conviction, the conviction of things not seen is to say, we've cross-examined it, we've scrutinized it, we've put it to the test, and, it, and it's still there, though you can't see it. That's the idea. It's still there, though you can't see it. You don't have to see it to be convinced, to know after cross-examination, after uh, scrutiny, uh, after assailing this assertion, that God exists, that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. 
you come to the conclusion, the conviction that he does exist and he does reward those who seek him. And there are things not seen that are nonetheless real. Now, this is a word that uh, translators used in Habakkuk, which is interesting to me. We already knew Habakkuk was the right context because of Hebrews 10, quoting from Habakkuk. But it's interesting to me that the Hebrews 11 word for conviction is the same word that is used in Habakkuk 2 in the Greek translation of it. Regarding the complaint, the argument that Habakkuk is offering to the Lord. It's there that the prophet is concerned about, you know, in chapter 1, Lord, how long will I cry for help and you will not hear, at verse 2, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you look idly at wrong? That's very much in keeping with the way that people think. Even today, uh, we, we are concerned about why are so many bad things happening around us? Why is there suffering in the world? This kind of thing. Uh, chapter 1, 13, you who are purer of eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you look idly at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Well, he does for a time. But when Habakkuk um, finishes this argument, he says in chapter 2, verse 1, I'll take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what will he say to me. What will I answer concerning this complaint? This is the argument that Habakkuk is offering, that, well, it's unjust what's happening, and uh, you are just, and how can, you know, how can this be a good God who sees this bad suffering happening and, and is allowing it to happen? That's the argument that's being presented. And he wants to know what's the answer to this thing. And of course, we're told very plainly at verse 2 of Habakkuk 2, the Lord did answer me. <laughs> so here comes the answer. This is what you need to know. He said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. First thing is, this is immediately applicable. You take hold of this and you get going. Second thing, still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, the evildoer's soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him, but the righteous man will live by his faith. The answer to this question is the person who is right in the eyes of God will be delivered by means of their trust in God. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. That's the assurance of things hoped for. Conviction of things not seen. You know, what we see is injustice in the world, but what is going to come is God will judge this world. The righteous person will be delivered because he trusts in the Lord. He waits on the Lord. The conviction of unseen things in this context here in Hebrews, which is the larger context, I'm sorry, in Habakkuk 2, which is the larger context of Hebrews 11. The conviction of unseen things is the endurance to keep going towards a spiritual future. That's the meaning. Though we don't see it, we keep going towards it. Remember he said, let him who reads it run in Habakkuk 2. Well, when you fast forward or maybe go back to Hebrews where we started, the larger context of Hebrews 11 on, on the front end we've talked about is this Habakkuk. On the back end is Hebrews 12 in verse 1, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us. It's a consistent theme. We are not reading things into the text. We are taking out of the text what has been placed there for us to take out of it. We are reading this correctly. 
the theme is keep going. Run with endurance. There's a reference, a direct reference back to Habakkuk, what we just read. This is recorded so that the one who reads it may run, meaning do it, do it now. The word is applicable now. Oh, the consequences might take time. Life will continue. Judgment may not be today, may not be tomorrow, may not be a hundred years from now, but it will come. But when is the time to live right? Today is the day of salvation. Let him who reads this run. Run with endurance. Hebrews 12, still talking about the long term, says in verse 5, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when convicted by him or reproved by him. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. The Lord chastises every son whom he receives. It's for discipline that you have to endure. There's the answer. It's another way of formulating what what Habakkuk said. It's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? This is actually meant, you know, I understand when we talk about discipline, we always think that that's a bad thing, (laughs) an unpleasant thing. But actually the word for discipline is just training, um, you know, instruction, maybe even like a branch of study in school. Um, what he's really saying is the fact that you need endurance, the fact that there is suffering here, um, the fact that we are sometimes reproved, sometimes uh, chastised, these things are good because they tell us that God is treating us like his children because children are treated with discipline. If he didn't love us, if he didn't care about us, then we would just go on our merry way and never notice anything. But that's not the way that a loving father behaves towards his children. A loving father gives his children what they need to know whether they like it or whether they don't. That's discipline. And our Father allows us to be tested, allows us to be tried, allows us to undergo suffering, that we might have patience, that we might have endurance, that we might grow. We're being treated as His children. It's meant to be a positive thing when it says this in Hebrews 12. That's what I'm getting at. It's not meant to be a threat, um, and it's not meant to invalidate You're thinking that, man, I don't really like this. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, yeah, I don't like this either, but this is a sure sign that you're being treated like a child of God because children are treated with discipline. The fact that you're allowed to suffer means that God has a certain amount of confidence in you. Remember, 1 Corinthians um, uh, 10 is telling us plainly that you cannot be, or you will not be tempted beyond what you're able to withstand. God God won't allow that to happen. Whatever is testing you is testing you in part because God has a certain amount of confidence that you can handle that. So you're being treated as a child. This is meant to say, well, keep going. Don't let that stop you. (laughs) You've been entrusted with this thing. Keep going. Endure. Be patient. Return to God the glory that is His because we keep going, because we run with endurance. All right, so there's the consistency of Hebrews. I think that's fairly plain, and that's the big picture when we talk about conviction. Now let's talk about things that are not seen, unseen things. And we're back here in Hebrews 11, things that are not seen. Well, first thing to talk about is the, this word, this vocabulary word for seeing. In the original text, we're talking about You know, there's multiple verbs of seeing in Greek. Let's just put it that way. There's synonyms, multiple different ways of talking about seeing. This is the word that's talking about visibility to the naked eye, what what you actually lay eyes on. It's the opposite of being blind. 
A blind person, by definition, is the person who cannot apprehend things with the eyes. They, the eyes cannot see. They do not perceive in that way. They might still see very clearly with the mind's eye, you know, in the sense of, oh, I see what's going on. But that's not this verb. This verb is the one that's about being able to see with your eyes, the power of sight. And in fact, the lexicon points out that it's distinct from perception and awareness. It's not the mental exercise, it's the physical one. So when we say we have a conviction of things not seen, we mean of conviction of things that you cannot lay eyes on. They're not physical, they're maybe not reality, at least not at the moment. On the other hand, in the third verse of Hebrews 11, he says, by faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God. This word for understand in Hebrews 11.3 is the counterpart that does mean perception of the mind. It includes perception by means of eyesight, but it's typically used for the mind. It's the, N-O, it's the NOI that's in paranoid when your mind is beside itself. <laughs> Okay, that's that mind, that that the thinking. What's what's going on in in, in between the uh, in between the ears? It's the thing that dogs don't have. You know, <laughs> nothing happening up there. <laughs> Believe me, I have three of them. I can tell you, <laughs> they understand nothing, though they do see. Uh, but there's a difference between that. Hebrews 11.1, 1, we perceive by sight nothing regarding the faith, and yet we perceive by the mind, Hebrews 11.3, everything regarding the faith. I find that a very useful juxtaposition, and that's why we brought it for you, forward for you today. But we're convicted, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, of things not perceived by sight, and yet we do perceive by mind that God's Word created everything. So perception is not, is not the issue here. You know, faith is not the opposite of reason. A person who believes is not unintelligent. What we're saying here is that, you know, the sight or the understanding of Hebrews 11.3, it's what some have called seeing by faith's eye. <laughs> by faith's eye or the mind's eye if you're into that. But that observation by faith is the one that doesn't involve things that you lay eyes on, that you see. When we talk about the understanding of the mind in Hebrews 11.3, it's the kind of word, there's lots of uses, but it's clear in the original text that we're talking about you know, this deductive reasoning, our ability to get it, you know, Oh, I get it. I understand what's going on here. I see what that means. I see what you're getting at. You know, that kind of meaning. It's like Matthew 15, 17, when the Lord upbraids the apostles. You know, he talked about beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they said, oh, yeah, we didn't bring enough bread in this boat. No, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> And he said, don't you see? Or they asked about, you know, is it, do you have to wash your hands before you eat? And not, not religiously. You know, your mom will tell you to do that, and you should do that, because your mom, you need to listen to your mom. But religiously, no. It's what he says in Matthew 15, 17 is, don't you see? Don't you get it? Whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled. It's reasoning. Right, it's perception, uh, it's understanding, observing how this works. Or Romans 1, verse 20, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived. You can understand that, you can perceive that, you can draw that conclusion how? Ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, it leaves everyone without excuse. We can see by the way that the world is ordered, by the power of the universe, by the fact that time is itself a physical construct, that it must be the one who did this is timeless and more powerful than anything that we can lay eyes on. 
So that is understanding. That's observing by faith. That's what he's getting at in Hebrews 11.3. And the thing that we observe is that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is now seen wasn't made out of things that are visible. This didn't used to be here. <laughs> what he's saying, <laughs> this didn't used to exist. It only exists because God told it to exist. He called it in, into existence by speaking the word. As John 1 tells us, nothing was created without God said, let it be. And that's how these things came into being. God made this happen with his word. That's how powerful his word is. But there was nothing seen. There was nothing to see. He brought this forth from his word. And does it matter? Yes, of course it matters. If you go back in 2 Corinthians 4, when Paul is talking to them about, you guessed it, keeping on, <laughs> staying in it, persevering, enduring, he said to them in 2 Corinthians 4 at verse 6, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Hmm. When did he say, let the light shine out of the dark? Ah, oh, that's Genesis chapter 1. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, right? And God said, let there be light, and there was. This God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God by means of the face of Jesus Christ. This Jesus, the Son of God, come in the flesh, is the express representation of God on earth. Hebrews 11, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us in, in verses 1 through 3. They try to tell me that it doesn't matter what you believe about the creation. If you believe that God did what he said he did, or if you believe that scientists should be listened to instead, they tell me that doesn't matter. But that's a lie. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the God who gives us the knowledge of glory in Christ Jesus. If he didn't create the world, then you're not a Christian either. If he didn't create the world, you're not raised, you're not forgiven of your sins. If he didn't make this world out of things that cannot be seen, then why do you believe in a resurrection? Why do you think there's life after this? Now, it actually is quite important. But it's this God who gave us that glory. And yet, the seventh verse said, we have this treasure in jars of clay. It's a great treasure to know Christ, and it's a great treasure that the apostles have the truth that they got us into. Absolutely it is, and yet we are jars of clay, earthen vessels. Why do we have this treasure in jars of clay? Well, on the one hand, you know, it's not without precedent. Jesus took on flesh. He had a body as you and I have a body. He had a life force, you know, needed oxygen, the same as you and I have a life force and need oxygen. But you and I have human spirits. He had the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah, and that we're pretty different, aren't we? But he did have flesh. There was this glory in a jar of clay. There it was, Jesus Christ himself, which was foreshadowed by the temple or by the tabernacle. Remember, all of the beautiful things, the gold, the artwork was inside of a tent made of animal skins that looked like any other tent. It was in jars of clay this treasure in jars of clay. Why? To show the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. The power to overcome, the power to surpass is God's power. We put our faith in him, not in ourselves. When we go back and look at the rest of Hebrews 11, not all of it, not right now, but look and see. Isn't it what the examples tell us? When you talk about Noah in Hebrews 11, it says by faith, verse 7, Noah, warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the salvation of his household. 
By doing this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by means of faith. You and I did not see the creation of the world. We didn't hear the word of God that said, let there be light or any of the other things. It's true. But you know what? Noah didn't either. He wasn't there. <laughs> he had Genesis 1 through 3, the same as you and me. He had the same word of God. He'd never seen the world created. He didn't see that happen, but he also had never seen the world destroyed by water. From what we can tell in the record, it had never even rained to that point. What it said was the earth was being watered by mists that came up. Sounds like it didn't even rain at that point. The world was such a different place that it was getting water in a different way. So for God to say that the sky was going to open and pour water down and it was going to flood the earth, nobody had ever seen anything like it. But he believed God when God said that was going to be. He believed God that he had created this world and that he could take it out too. We've never seen the world destroyed by fire, but we know that God said he's going to do that in 2 Peter 3. And look what Noah did. Because he knew that there would be rain. He knew there would be a flood. He knew God was going to do exactly what God said he was going to do. What did he do? Because of this, he constructed an ark. We know that it's real. That's what that means. He believed God. It was real. It was so real that he built an ark in the middle of a generation who didn't believe in God, who didn't believe this was going to happen. You can be sure they made fun of him. You know, there goes old man Noah. You know, <laughs> yeah, keep building, old man. <laughs> you know, that's what happened. But he was right. God spoke, and God is believable. And he built that ark, and it saved him and his own household. If you go back into 2 Corinthians 4, you know, this is the, the purpose, the endurance. He said we have this treasure in jars of clay so that the strength is God, so it can be clear the strength is God's. So the 16th verse of 2 Corinthians 4 continues, so we do not lose heart. In this way, we do not lose heart. You know, Noah kept on building. From what we can tell in the text, it took him about 100 years building the ark during which time he was a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter tells us. He didn't lose heart. He kept building. Don't think to yourself there's not room on that ark for the people. God could make more animals. He would have let the people aboard. Noah kept building. Don't lose heart. That's what he's saying. Though the outer self may waste away, the inner self is renewed daily. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are not seen. We don't lose heart because we are looking not to what can be seen. We're looking to what cannot be seen. Noah kept building because he knew, though it had not been seen, it was going to rain. It was going to flood. God was going to bring a judgment. He knew that was real. So he built that ark. We live the Christian life today. We make the right choices because we know God is going to judge us. There is a blessing waiting for those who love him. So we are not looking at what can be seen because when you do that, then you see, yeah, there's good things. There are blessings. We don't discount that and we shouldn't let it be uh, taken away from us. But there are bad things too. We see suffering. We see stuff happening. As he said, what child is there whom his father doesn't discipline? Bad things happen and we have to deal with it. But we're not looking at that. We're looking at the things that cannot be seen. Did you notice what he said in the, in the 17th verse of 2 Corinthians 4? This light momentary affliction. What's that? 
It's your lifetime. My lifetime is a light momentary affliction. How so? In perspective. In perspective. How is that so? It is because, as he said, it prepares for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Our life, however long it or short it might prove to be, is very short compared to eternity. And we suffer here, it's true and it's real, and we don't take away from that, we don't minimize that, but we're saying it's worth it though, and by comparison to the bliss of being with God forevermore, it's well worth it. In that comparison, in that perspective, we can reckon this life to be a light, momentary affliction. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Yes, he said, this is because we look not to things seen, but to things unseen, because the things seen are transient. The things unseen are the eternal things. Transient and eternal. The things that are seen, they're all going to be gone. This is going to disappear one day, won't be anymore. And whether that happens because the Lord comes back or whether I pass away, one way or the other, you know, I and the things that I lay eyes on all around me are going to part ways relatively soon. That's just the truth. That's transient. The unseen things in God, those are the eternal things. And yes, he said, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, chapter 5, verse 1, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Even if this body should be destroyed, he said, and there are things that destroy this body from disease to persecution, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There's something that outlasts. And it's what was recorded in Hebrews 11 and verse 10, that these who walked by faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Noah, all the others who are mentioned, it says, Hebrews 11, 10, that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He wasn't looking necessarily for what would be his in his lifetime. He was looking for that eternal city of God. And yet Romans 8 talks about this as well, the same idea, again, not to invalidate our suffering, not to minimize what we're going through. That's, that's not right. That's not kind. It's not loving. You are in the flesh too. You should fear. But rather, it's to have the right perspective about this. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. You see, the Spirit testifies that we are children, provided that we suffer. That's what Hebrews 12 just told us. It's for discipline you have to endure. What child is there whose father doesn't discipline him? It's not saying, oh yeah, you deserve this, put up with this, or stop complaining. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, take that as the sign that it is. You are a child of God. That's why this is happening to you. The Spirit bears witness that you're children of God when you live that way. And... The 18th verse of Romans 8 continues, I consider the sufferings of the present time not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time do not compare 
to the glory that's going to be revealed. The same Paul that wrote 2 Corinthians, wrote this too, that's, that, that wrote the Hebrew letter, that the same thought is very consistent across all of them. It's what we just read in 2 Corinthians 4. Same thought. Keep going. The message to Corinth is keep going. The message to Rome is keep going. The message to the Jews of the first century who would become the teachers of the church of the first century is keep going. That's Hebrews. Keep going. And he finishes up in Romans 8, 24 and 25 saying this, In this hope we have been saved. Hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. See that? There's the unseen things. There's the hope. There's the assurance. There's the patient endurance while we wait for it. If it seems slow, wait for it. It won't be long. The righteous one will live by his faith. Yeah, we're reading this correctly, aren't we? We got this right. That's, that's what it says. It's very consistent. The Bible? The Bible is right. The Bible is its own best commentary. Finally, we look in Hebrews chapter 2. So we talk about the invitation of God that you might obey the gospel. Are you today a Christian? Are you a child of God? Consider your estate. Have you obeyed God? Have you laid hold of eternity? And if not, what is stopping you from doing so? Well, Hebrews 2 captures for us this thought in the 8th and ninth verses that the Old Testament said everything would be put in subjection under his feet, which is true. But at present, Hebrews 2, verse 8, at present, we don't yet see everything in subjection to him. That's right. We look around and we see, well, people have free will. And sometimes they use that free will to do the wrong thing. And sometimes we suffer. Sometimes we suffer for our own wrongdoing. Sometimes we suffer the, the wrongdoing of others. And that is still my favorite. It's still my favorite Facebook meme that I saw. <laughs> it said everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is you are stupid and make bad decisions. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's true. Sometimes that is why. <laughs> I've done something wrong. There's going to be consequences for that. And I should accept that there's going to be consequences for that. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you're suffering because you're righteous. The devil is not content to let that be alone. We don't see everything in subjection to him yet. No, we don't. But we do see this. Verse 9, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Yeah, we don't see everything subject to him yet, but we do see this. He was subjected to humility. He was subjected to death and raised from the dead, as the witnesses testify. The apostles of the Lord those who knew him in the first century. And he tasted death for all of us, that we might be saved. If today you are not a Christian, obey the gospel of Jesus. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in his name, putting to death the old person of sin, to be resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus, to be a new creation, if you will. Just as the world was formless and void and there was darkness, but there was the Spirit of God above the surface of the waters in the creation. So also, when you put to death the old person of sin, there is the water. There is the Spirit. And something is about to emerge from that water, a new creation in Christ Jesus that comes forth by the power of His Word. It's His Word that you're obeying when you become a Christian. If 
you need our help today, you're a Christian but haven't lived right, repent, make things right. Let us pray with you and for you that you can be restored. But take the big picture of Hebrews. It is keep going. Keep on keeping on. If we can help you with our prayers as a Christian, if we can help you to obey the gospel, to become a Christian, please let your need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>